Well, hey there. It is Wednesday, and we are super happy that you're joining us today on Stacking Benjamins. If you're new to the show and you didn't hear Monday's episode, uh, one week after eight weeks of hard podcasting, we play usually Greatest Hits episodes. But this week is a different week. On Monday, we showed you a phenomenal interview from our sister show, Stacking Deeds, our real estate show, with a gentleman who is in construction, Mark Ellison, who works on some of the most beautiful places on earth. And it was really not about construction or real estate. It was about communication. And I hope you enjoyed it. Today, we're going to do something similar. We're going back to our Stacking Deeds show because Paula Pant joined us over there. Our very own Paula Pant from Afford Anything, who's been a contributor on this show for the last Man, I think it's been well over 11 years that Paula has been working side by side with us. Paula's going to talk about some of her real estate mistakes. And I love it no matter what business you're in. When you talk about the mistakes that you make and you address those mistakes. So this is from our sister show, Stacking Deeds, with special guest, the one and only Paula Pant. from the back of Ruth the Realtor's car, it's the Stacking Deed Show. I'm Ruth's neighbor and part-time mechanic, neighbor Doug, broadcasting from the spacious, luxurious Trunk Recording Studio. Today we bring you a special episode of the Stacking Deed Show. We'll talk for nearly an hour about her real estate journey with our BFF from the Afford Anything Show, Paula Pant. No surprise, she's got a plan. And now, two peeps who are also BFFs, it's CLH and J-Ass, whoever they are. Easy, <laughs> I don't think it's how it's usually pronounced, Doug. We don't usually... It makes Aren't sense you? logically. Use your context clues. That's what I was always taught. <laughs> Well, you can hear my co-host, Crystal Hammond, who we don't have in the back seat of the car today. I've got the spacious oh. back seat all to myself. Doug's in the trunk, and I got somebody else's junk in my trunk today. Oh. <laughs> I've been called worse. <laughs> and from a remote location from the Windy City, we've got Crystal oh. Hammond joining us. How are you? Wonderful. I am staring at a big Trump sign you, <laughs> in my hotel. Right behind, we don't do video yet for the show. We actually right, have a meeting yeah. where we're going to start doing video, but you got upgraded to a room overlooking the Trump Tower. Yes. And they asked if I wanted to do the $50 upgrade, and I was like, oh, no, thanks. And then the person starts typing like forever and then says, oh, we upgraded you for free. You get the beautiful lake view. And then that was the view. I was like, oh, it turns out it's the tower view. It's not the lake view. It's the this tower is view. Like the hotel equivalent of when you have a little disagreement at a restaurant and you're worried they might spit in your food. They're like, oh, we upgraded you for free. And <laughs> <laughs> their version is we'll give her a view. We're going to make crystal great again. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> it's so beautiful. It is still a beautiful view. You when you told me that the sign lights up super bright, I just pictured that Seinfeld episode when they put the Kenny Rogers roasters right out, the neon sign right outside of Kramer's apartment. And it was so bright that it gave him a sunburn. <laughs> oh <my laughs> he shows God. up and Jerry's, it's all red. <laughs> so Crystal, what's your middle initial mean then? What's it's your middle name? S it's with an L, C-L-H. Crystal Lynn. Nope. It's luscious. Oh, it luscious. <laughs> luscious lips. <laughs> luscious leases. There we go. Luscious lease. It's Louise. Louise. Crystal yeah. Louise Hammond. And by the, by the way, Louise was one of my favorite characters. Remember Teen Witch? You're going to be the uh, that was Sorry, they were not targeting my demographic with that show. That was a good movie. That was a good, liked it. That was a good that was a good movie. It's see, movie. no nose. We need to do videos so people can see the crystal dance with the song. Oh though. yeah, with the shoulders. Crystal, we might as well get this show rolling. We got a great show today. We've got Paula Pant joining us from Afford Anything. She's gonna tell me her money story here in the back seat. 
Oh yeah, me and Paula, we all go way back. I sat by her parents when she won. We both won Plutus Awards the same year. She's won a whole bunch, but her parents are so cute. Yeah, we, we were sitting by each other. Yeah, you figure award. out where Paula got her lack of height from when we met her parents <laughs> in Orlando that year. She comes by it honestly. I think between them, they're probably an MBA size. Like if you put them all on each other's, oh, <laughs> if you stack them up, right? <laughs> if you stack the three of them, you get somebody who's six foot six. So you never told us what JS stood for. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an A. It's an A, and it's not what you guys are inferring. What's the A? Doug might know what the I A is. I know exactly what the A is. Austin. Do you want this public? I don't care. Yeah. Your A was what my first name was supposed to be originally. My parents fought over this. It's not Austin, but Austin's a good one. We That'd almost named my son Austin, uh -huh. by the way. Yeah, that's more current, well, more trendy. But he's Andrew, Crystal. Yeah. He's Andrew. Andrew. Yeah, and my mom wanted that really badly for me to be my name. And my dad's like, I'm not going to have a son who's going to be called Andy. Andy gets beaten up on the playground. Oh, but bringing this turns out Doug's do too. <laughs> <laughs> but Crystal, bringing this back to real estate, if we would have named our son Austin, those property values would have gone through the roof. Like now he'd be almost 30. And the property value on the name Austin, if it's like the city of Austin, oh. would be worth a lot more than 30 years ago. Maybe. You so. <laughs> <laughs> You're not a fan of Austin? Have you been to Austin? I love Austin, but I don't think naming your kid has anything to do with. Uh... Oh, well, then let's move on. <laughs> yeah. We got a great show. We got Paula Pant joining us. Very <laughs> special episode, Crystal. We're not going to have Doug's trivia today. We're not going to have our call in. We're not going to do a headline. We got 45 minutes of Paula Pant's story. Yeah. And also we have Paula's real estate course. She's a brand new real estate course, Crystal, called Your First Rental Property. And to get there, if you go to stackingbenjamins.com, stackingbenjamins.com, not stacking deeds, but stackingbenjamins.com slash Paula, that will lead you to our, like what she's doing so much, we'll, we've affiliated with her. So if you want to get yourself better at real estate and you want to help the show, that's yeah. going to be the link. Joe, you blew it. Do you know anything about like self-promotion or getting in touch with our audience? At the beginning of that, you said no trivia. We just <laughs> lost most of the audience. They're gone. Well, They're probably because... not even hearing me say this. The minute you said, the second you said no trivia, click <laughs> next podcast. If we don't get started, we're going to lose the rest of them. So let's go. <laughs> and the Paula Pant joins us. How are you? I am great. How are you doing? Holy cow, am I great. You've got some energy, girlfriend, today. Oh, my, well, thank you. I'm on my first cup of coffee. So it seems like you're on cup three or four. <laughs> no, I'm only halfway through cup one. So it's a good Just day. Don't want to know day. after three then. I don't want to know. Let's start off going negative because these deeders of ours, Paula, you know, just need to know that this isn't always easy. What's the biggest mistake you ever made with real estate? First of all, Dieters. Dieters, that is the best name. Why, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the Dieters. All right. Well, hello, Dieters. Biggest, well, I mean, Joe, you probably didn't expect the answer to go to, well, I'll talk about a few mistakes. The biggest mistake right. I ever made with real estate is not getting a prenup, but that's a whole different conversation <laughs> for a different day. That is Woo! a whole different thing. Woo -hoo -hoo! I suppose technically the worst mistake I ever, well, yeah. But outside of marrying the wrong person, the other biggest mistake that I ever made with real estate, geez, what was it? You know what it was? It was in the early days, I mistakenly thought that if I did the work myself, then that meant that my profits would go up, right? Sure. It's the magical bull poop accounting of thinking, hey, if I'm the person who's painting or installing floorboard, uh, Demo. You know, yeah, exactly. If I'm the person who is doing the actual handy person work, which I'm not that good at doing and I don't enjoy doing, but YouTube exists for a reason, you know? And so when I was in my 20s, I thought if I'm the one who's doing that, then I don't have to pay for a contractor to do that. And that means that my quote unquote profits are higher. And I even in the early days went so far as to think, well, that's my competitive advantage, right? Made the mistake of like taking a fancy sounding term, competitive advantage, and thinking that that necessarily, you know, meant something. 
So competitive uh, advantage was that you are becoming a carpenter yourself. Yeah, basically. You know, I was like, then not just a carpenter. I was trying to do every piece of it. Like I got a real estate agent license so that that way, if I ever went to sell any of my properties, I would be able to keep the commission on the buy side. I would get a bit of a commission, you know, like, well, also it would help me find properties yeah. by searching directly on the MLS, right? So do you know how Tesla does this whole vertical integration thing where yes. every step of the car manufacturing process, they do themselves. Right. SpaceX, same thing. They do this vertical integration thing. I was basically trying to take that vertical integration model and apply that to the way that I invested in real estate. And by the way, for our mm -hmm. dealers, what that means is that if Tesla decides that they want to upgrade something they can do a system reset that's electronic. And because Tesla owns the entire car, every mm -hmm. single thing is going to talk to that car. So frankly, they could just change the computer chip and the entire car will either respond or not respond to the computer chip because they control the whole process. Where Ford is an example, mm -hmm. Ford uses a bunch of outside manufacturers. So maybe mm -hmm. the chassis doesn't respond or the seat belts don't respond or whatever it is. And because mm -hmm. of that, Ford has a more difficult time if you bring the car in, you know, putting these different systems together. Exactly. Exactly. And just think of how it is, Joe, you and I in our own businesses, if we want to, we we're just talking about this right before we hit record, right? Anything that we want to do related to video editing, right? Or just video recording, we're dealing with outside third parties and we don't quite know how their systems work. And then there's this whole step in the process where we're like, all right, we need somebody on our team who can contact somebody from their team and figure out how all of these systems and processes can work together. Right. A company like Tesla doesn't have to do that because they've done everything, you know, every piece of the process they own. So, so, so anyway. far, none of your thinking sounds flawed. Like you're going to cut your cost by knowing how to do electrical. I mean, just to be completely <laughs> ludicrous, right? <laughs> Shockingly good at it. Oh, and then, and then <laughs> but my plumbing <laughs> skills are kind of shitty. <laughs> but up, seriously, but she's here all week. And then you're going to become a realtor to cut out the real estate cost and to get a leg mm -hmm. up. And when properties are just going on the MLS, you're going to see the hot new stuff and maybe get it before everybody else gets it. And then third, you're creating this just vertical integration system so that it's all in house. So if anything goes, whatever, you've got it. I'm surprised you're calling this a mistake. <laughs> well, so what that doesn't leave any time for, number one, it doesn't leave time for having any type of other job, like afford anything, right? Um, but number two, it also doesn't leave time for growing the business, right? If you're spending all of your time working inside of your business, then you have no time to actually grow the business, which is buy more properties, you know, or raise more funds to buy more properties. Ultimately, what does the CEO of any company or the director of any nonprofit, what's their primary job? It's make sure that you have enough money in order to continue growing. As the leader of a company, that is your number one job, right? And depending on the type of company that you run or the type of nonprofit that you run, it could come from increased revenue. It could come from, if you run a nonprofit, that comes from donors, if you run an early stage startup, it might come from venture capital funds. But no matter what your source of funding is, whether it's revenue or donors or VC or whatever, your job as the leader of a company is raise funds to grow. And if you're spending all of your time watching YouTube videos about how to pull up baseboard, right, then you're not raising funds to grow. But you might tell yourself that you are because you tell yourself the story that Oh, by virtue of pulling up the baseboard myself, I'm saving money, which is a form of raising funds, but it's just not the most efficient way to do it. It's mm -hmm. almost like capping your budget or working on the expense side versus working on the income side. Exactly. You can, only, you can only shrink it so much by pulling up the baseboard yourself, where if you go out and find new business, that's a blue sky. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, I think back to the amount of time that I spent in... 2012, 2013, 2014, working on painting the fence, right? Repainting the fence myself rather than figuring out how to buy one extra property. And 
if you think about it, and this, I don't know, maybe this is taking the logic a little bit too far, but let's go there. Let's say that all of the hours that I spent painting fences, resealing the flooring, things like that, let's say that if instead of spending those hours doing that, I could have spent those hours buying just one additional property, just one. And let's say that that property, granted, 2012 through 2023 is a very special time and we shouldn't expect that to repeat. But let's just say that that one property, had I bought it in 2012 or 2013, would have grown an extra $250,000 in equity in the last decade, right? You could make the argument that the time that I spent painting the fence actually cost me a quarter of a million dollars, right? You could make the argument that that was the most expensive way of doing that work rather than the cheapest. Initially, though, do you want to know, and painting the fence isn't the right analogy, but let's take the plumbing analogy or the baseboard analogy. Do you want to know a little bit about how to do those things so that when you're working with these, inevitably your team, that they're not ripping you off, that you can at least speak the language? Mm. So it's funny that you say speak the language. I'm a big believer that you need the vocabulary to be able to speak to your contractors. So you need to know with like your gutters, there's the gutter and there's the downspout, right? And it's simple, but you need that vocabulary. With a toilet, there's a toilet flange, right? You need to be able to talk about the flange, right? What's the quote from that movie? We don't talk about Coco. Wait, are you about to I'm quote make a, movie? a movie reference? Yeah. Holy, who are you? It's, is it we don't really talk about Coco? Is no, is that no? We don't talk about Bruno. Bruno, Bruno. We don't talk about Bruno, right? Yes. We right? don't talk about People, flange. Yeah, we don't talk about flange. We need to talk about the toilet flange. <laughs> um, uh, Paula, can I have a talk with you? We need to talk <laughs> toilet flange. <laughs> And the reason for that is a fewfold. One is when you are having those conversations with contractors, having the right vocabulary just enables the conversation to take place. You know, you're not going to be able to actually have an intelligent conversation about here's the diagnosis, here is a menu of the potential types of treatments. Now let's talk through which of these potential treatments we can give to this diagnosis, right? You need the right vocabulary to be able to have that conversation. And in addition to that, particularly when you're working with a new contractor, you need to be able to signal to them that I am an informed consumer, like sure. I'm an informed client, yeah. and having the right vocabulary creates that signal. So for both of those reasons, I think knowing the jargon is incredibly important. So in this course on rental property investing, right, your first rental property, and we have a huge section in there about learning the jargon. And that's entirely so that you can show up sounding like an informed client. My son, Nick, who you know, actually mm -hmm. took this, Paula, to the next level, which yeah. I did not expect. And it's worked out very, very well for him. Not only did he make sure he was getting up to speed on the language, he literally found out that most of his houses are in Detroit and most of the people on the construction crews are Mexican or Central American and don't speak much English at all. And when they talk to each other, they speak in Spanish to each other. Nick, who's a very quick learner, realized that he was getting from general contractors he was working with some of the story, but he wanted to make sure he got all the story. He learned Spanish. Wow. And even a lot of the general contractors now that he works with, who are fantastic, are native Spanish speakers. And when he speaks to them in their language, we were doing some help with him on one house. And one of the generals said, your son is one of the few landlords we work with who actually speak Spanish. And it makes it so much easier to work with him. It makes it mm. so much easier. And so he gets this respect as a 28 year old buying houses. He gets a respect. I think a lot of guys in their twenties might not get because he's coming right. to them to talk about the work. I thought that was pretty brilliant. I love that. That's fantastic. Was, yeah, I absolutely love that. It was so wild. So let's talk about that, though, your first house, right? And buying that first house. What's the most important thing to get right on buying your first rental property? Mm, there is a particular formula. It's this thing that you're calculating for. It's called the cap rate. And I want to explain conceptually what this is. So 
when you buy a stock, you are buying two things. You are buying the potential for that stock to go up over time, and that's called capital appreciation. But you're also buying an income stream or a dividend that comes from that stock, right? When you buy a house for investment purposes, you're doing the same thing. You're buying the potential for that house to go up over time, and you're also buying an income stream from that house. Now, when you buy a stock, unless you are buying what on margin, which is just a fancy way of saying with debt, when you buy a stock, then most of the time as an ordinary mom and pop individual investor, you're buying it with cash. You're not buying it with debt. So if we want to make a comparison between buying a stock and buying an investment property, for the time being, let's just take debt out of the equation and let's look at what that house is going to return if you were to hold it free and clear. Now, we're not saying that you will, sure. like you're almost certainly going to borrow for this home. But in order to evaluate whether or not this particular house is a good investment, we want to ask ourselves the question, would I own this in cash? Because my philosophy, and there are many real estate investors who disagree with me, but my philosophy is if it's not worth owning in cash, then it's not worth owning with a loan. There are some real estate investors who disagree and they basically say, well, cash, this different metric called cash on cash return is more important because cash on cash return measures the return that you get relative to the amount of money that you put into the deal. My personal philosophy is that the cash on cash return formula is a formula that can make a house look good only if you borrow to buy it, but it's not ultimately a house that you would ever want to own in cash because the returns, if you owned it in cash, wouldn't actually be that good. Which means that your metric then it sounds like is more conservative. Yeah, it is. It's a more conservative metric because my metric is cap rate. It's all about the cap rate. And the cap rate basically is a measure, I'm going to use two big fancy words, unleveraged dividend, right? Which basically means what's that dividend? What's that income stream? If you own it in cash, if you didn't borrow for that house, what would be your dividend, so to speak? And the way that you calculate that is you look at the gross, the total revenue that that house produces, you subtract out the operating expenses, repairs, maintenance, major capital expenditures, property management fees, you subtract all of those operational expenses out. And then whatever is left over, you divide that by the value of the property or the price that you paid for the property. And that is your cap rate. And so if you have, for example, a 6% cap rate, that means that you have the equivalent of a 6% dividend that you are getting from that property. And so your total unleveraged return would be that 6% dividend plus, let's just assume the property rises at an average rate of 3% or 4% annually, right? We'll say 4% annually. That 6% dividend plus that 4% annual growth comes to a total of 10%. That 10% would be your unleveraged total return. In other words, that's the return that the house is giving you if you held it in cash. And then the other metric that you mentioned then, which mm -hmm. is a true because you are leveraging it, yeah. means that you're probably popping a much bigger number then once you leverage yes. it. Yes, yes, yes. So there's this other metric that most real estate investors absolutely love. Then this is where I become different from the average real estate investor because I'm very cautious about it. So this metric is called cash on cash return. And the formula is basically how much money did you put into the deal relative to how much money are you getting out of the deal? So if you go in and put in a tiny little down payment, right? If you go in and put, let's say that you are buying a home with an FHA loan, maybe you're doing your first house hack. So you put 3.5% down, you borrow the other 96.5% of the money, you buy a four unit property, you live in one of the units, you rent out the other three, right? You've put very, very little money into the deal. Let's just say it's a $300,000 loan. You've put about $10,000 into the deal. Given that you've put so little into the deal and given that what you're getting from that deal is a lot of money relative to the tiny amount that you've put in, your cash on cash returns therefore are huge. I mean, I've seen 
cash on cash returns that are 25%, 30%. I mean, big, big, big return numbers. The reason that I'm cautious is hypothetically, if you put $0 into the deal, your returns would be infinity. And whenever you have a formula or a construct where your returns are infinity, that should be a red flag. Well, the red flag for me is that that formula encourages you then to leverage even harder, right? The harder you leverage, the better it is. And we just know from past experience, maybe some people don't know, 2007, 2008, and you know, the landscape might change. And if I'm super leveraged to get that cash on cash return, that unwinds a lot quicker. It gets ugly quicker, I think, for you. And that's what I want to worry about. I mean, I always want to worry about what if the worst happens? If the worst happens to me, I want to make sure that I've got my downside covered. Exactly. The way that I like to say it is leverage, it's a lever. And a lever, if you think of a seesaw, it can rise you up into the air really quickly. A seesaw can also plummet you back down. Have you ever been on a seesaw and the person on the other end jumps off and boom, you like hit the ground really hard, right? That's what a lever can do, you know? So imagine just the bigger that end of the seesaw, right? If it's a tiny seesaw, something designed for like little kids, you know, the two sides of the seesaw, the lever is going to be rather small. If you're at Burning Man, right? If you're at a festival and they're making some ridiculous giant novelty seesaw for grownups, like that's a type of seesaw that can hoist you really, really high into the air. And it's also going to really hurt yeah. when you come crashing down. <laughs> Josh Dorkin, who created uh-huh. Bigger Pockets, our friend over there, Josh had a great quote that he said to me one time, which was that, you know, you see so many people offering real estate products because of the fact that leverage creates more quick winners. Yeah. But also when you go through times that are inevitable, like 2007, 2008, leverage mm-hmm. also flushes out far more people, far more people. It's funny because, you know, if people use leverage to buy stocks, you know, we call that options. And a lot of most investors will go, are you crazy? What are you mm-hmm. doing buying these options? Really? You're going to leverage your stock portfolio? That's crazy. In real estate, we call it a mortgage. And right. Everybody, and everybody does it. Right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> it just, it's so wild when I hear some of these people just go, you know, leverage is your friend. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. However, you know, it could, that knife's got two sides. Yeah. You know, in the course, I refer to them as debt loving weirdos. <laughs> <laughs> and I talk about not drinking the cash on cash Kool Aid. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not Dave Ramsey about this. I think that a very moderate amount of leverage is fine, right? It's what gets you into the game, but it just needs to be taken with a giant, not just a grain of salt, but a giant salt shaker, right? <laughs> Well, because the thing that you have, Paula, with real estate is you do have this income stream coming in that can pay that mortgage. So you do have where with stocks, you know, finding a stock position that will give you a dividend high enough to make that option worth it is a lot. So it truly isn't tomato to tomato or orange to orange or whatever. I thought Um, you were going to say tomato to tomato. I I suppose I should say apples (laughs) to apples, which is what most people say. But I didn't come up with the obvious one. What I should have said was apples to apples. Comparison, but instead of go tomato, tomato for some stupid reason. <laughs> but you know what I mean? It isn't the same because you do have a much bigger quote dividend with that rental income coming in. But I think you also have to think about what if I go for an extended period of time in an ugly market where I can't rent the house out for God knows what reason? What if I go six months without renting the house? For that reason, I know you keep a lot of cash on hand. Yes. So I'm a big fan of cash reserves. I typically recommend to my students that they keep three months worth of gross rent at the time that they initially buy the property because ballpark three months of gross rent will be roughly five to six months worth of operating expenses. Yeah. So at the time that they initially buy the property, keep at least three months of gross rent. If you know you're buying a fixer upper, then you want to keep more on hand because you also have to fix up that property to get it rent ready for the first tenant. But assuming that you're buying something that is move in ready on day one, keep three months of gross rent minimum. And then as you hold the house, slowly build those coffers until you've got six months of gross rent. So I think six months of rent per property is a good benchmark. 
Let's talk about that rent check because a lot of new investors get the finding a tenant piece wrong. What do people Mm -hmm. get wrong? You see more often than not with your students when it comes to going after a renter. When it comes to trying to identify and get that right person in the house. Ooh, that's a good question. I think people are maybe a little bit too metric driven. I know a lot of students who will say, I thought you were going to say the opposite. I thought you were going to say they're not metric driven. (laughs) Ah, no, no. I think my students are a little bit maybe too metric driven in that they, they want a very specific credit score, right? And they're like, if someone doesn't have at least X credit score, then I'm not going to consider them. We had a guest recently that was exactly the opposite. Her problem was she had to have a property manager, not because she felt like she necessarily needed one all the time. She's like, I am a pushover. And I will let the most homeless person that can't pay anything into my property. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a good example of know yourself. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. yeah. But most people, I would guess, when you're right, swing the other way. If you don't get a great credit score, then. Yeah, exactly. And the thing is, there are different reasons why a person might have a damaged credit score. And you can see when you run a credit check on a tenant, you can see their history. Do they have a history of lots and lots of late or missed payments on a lot of things, right? Basically, do they have just a history of not paying bills or paying bills late? Or do they have a history where they've consistently always paid bills in full and on time, but then they had one really major unfortunate gaffe? I had a tenant like that where I looked at his credit history and he was very, very consistent at paying his bills in full and on time, and this is like 2012, so this is in the aftermath of the Great Recession, he had owned his condo and his condo got foreclosed on, right? So that foreclosure on his condo wrecked his credit score. But with the exception of that one foreclosure, he had a very clean credit history. So, you know, I was happy to rent to him and he was a great tenant. So people don't dig into the credit score enough. Like they just take yeah. that number and boom. Yeah, they take really... the, they take the number without looking at the story, right? Which makes sense to me because it's going to be hard to find that perfect credit person that doesn't want to just go buy their own house. Right, right. It'd be I mean, so much more difficult. Yeah, and that part it depends. Like I've had many tenants who are just not in a position where they would want to buy a house. Like for example, you know, well, a bunch of my tenants were med students, so they were in school. I've had tenants who are in their first couple of jobs out of college and they don't know exactly how long they're going to be living in Atlanta. Maybe it'll just be for two or three years. You know, they're not ready to settle down. They want the flexibility to move around, to move to another city. Like for a lot of people who do have a good income and good credit scores, they're just not in a place in their life where they want to settle down and make this their home. And they, yeah. Yeah. My last tenant was a guy that just didn't realize that he could buy a house until I told him that I was selling the house and I would like to sell it to him. And he was shocked when he got a loan. He was shocked and I wasn't shocked. I wish he just never done the math. It was like, yeah, you could be my renter forever. That would be fantastic. But I, for a variety of reasons, decided to sell it and ended up selling it to my tenant, which was was really cool. Let's talk about the course. It's your first rental property. You, I know, not only put a lot of time into developing this course, Paula, but you this year went and put like, talk about painting the fence. You didn't paint the fence. You like gutted the inside and have completely renovated the place, even though like from reviews I saw last year, people that were in it loved it. So talk about what do people get with your first rental property? Mm -hmm. So your first rental property is a 10 week long course. We give it a cohort experience. So there's a very specific enrollment window. If you want to be part of the course, you have to enroll during this very limited time window. It's a 10 day long window. And once you enroll, everyone starts the course on the same day. And then we go through it together as a cohort for 10 weeks. Now, if something comes up and this more times than not, this usually happens to most people, something comes up, you get a big project at work, your kid trips and falls and you know, sprains their ankle and ends up, right? The life happens. And so people oftentimes are not able to kind of move along with the cohort, but we've designed it to be a cohort experience so that you have accountability, 
You have peers that you can learn all of this with. We have study halls like because we give you homework assignments. So there are study halls where we cover how to do the worksheet or how to fill out the spreadsheet, you know, how to do the homework assignment for the week. We have accountability groups where if you are in the active stage where you're actively making offers on properties and you need feedback from other people who are actively in that stage, right? We've got accountability groups for that. So it, it takes the loneliness and the throwing spaghetti at the wall, trying to figure out what the hell you're doing out of real estate investing because you've got a group to do this with. You've got TAs, teacher's assistants, who are all alumni of the course and they're all successful rental property investors who are there to guide you and help you through the process. And then the lessons that we walk through, we start with a module on how to analyze properties because that's the most important piece. So we spend two weeks covering how to do the math, how to analyze properties. There's very, very detailed spreadsheet that's part of that. Then we go into how to find properties. And it's not just the MLS. You can use the MLS if you want to. That's the multiple listing service, which is what the where publicly listed properties are listed. And that's one option. But we also tell you how to find off-market deals, right? That's the finding module. After that, we go into the financing module where we talk about all the different types of loans and loan products that are out there. And then we go into renovating the property. And it isn't Bob Vila's how to tear out the floorboards. It's how to think <laughs> through a renovation. How do you decide? What um, the if important you think parts. Of a, yeah, exactly. If you think of the spectrum, there's feasible on one end of the spectrum. There's optimal on the other end of the spectrum. Where within that spectrum do you want to be? So we think the renovation module is it's a module where we teach you the jargon, but it's also a module in which we teach you how to think through what scope of work you want that renovation to uh, to hit. And then we go into how to find a tenant, how to advertise for tenants, how to screen tenants, how to manage your tenants. If you are doing your own property management, how to process the move in and the move out. We talk about how to protect your properties, how to protect your assets, all of the administrative side of it. So all of that together turns into a big 10 week long course. I love the idea of the pack hunt, which my mm -hmm. early mentors told me, they're like, if you want to get good at something, do it with a group of people. Because that yeah. accountability piece that we all go, oh, I don't know if I want to be around a bunch of people. I really would rather do this by myself. You won't do it. At least I know right. I won't do it. When we moved to Texarkana, I had never run a marathon and I didn't really care about running marathons. And then just based on the group of new friends I had, they were all marathon runners, Paula. And mm -hmm. I've now run 11 marathons. Wow. And it is because of the fact that I hang out with these people. You know what I mean? I would have never done any of this stuff. I ran this morning because my buddy Troy wrote to me and goes, hey, you want to run at 6 a.m.? Hell no, I don't want to run at 6 a.m. <laughs> but if I get right. to hang out with Troy and go three miles and I know Troy's waiting for me, you know, mm. so I will get my ass out of bed at 530 in the morning if I know. So I love the idea of the cohort going through it together versus yeah. – not doing it with a group of people and, you know, you might finish it, you might not. And then that ends up being a waste of money. Like right. It, it isn't what you know, it's what you do. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. One of the things that we offer to our alumni, and this is always available forever, is with every new cohort that goes through the course, if there's an alumni who wants to be part of that new cohort and just ride along with that cohort experience, join that group, they're always welcome to do so. Come so back every and repeat a module. You can repeat a module. You can repeat the entire course. It's totally up to you. So we have a lot of alumni who do that. We always, at the beginning of each new cohort, we send out an email to all of our alumni. We have over 2,000 alumni at this point and say, hey, obviously you have lifetime access to the course. So you can go through at your own pace, at your own time, use it as a resource anytime you need. But given that we're coming up on a new cohort, if you want the group, the camaraderie of being part of this new cohort, come join us. And we always have a really high opt-in from previous alumni who are like, yes, I do want to. That's cool. That's great. Yeah. 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 I mean, it keeps us all sharp, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, and a lot of them will say like, the last time that I went through it, I was thinking about buying my first rental property, but I hadn't yet saved for a down payment. And I was in the process of moving and I was switching jobs. And so I wanted to learn about it because I wanted to get the lay of the land. 
But I knew at that time that this wasn't going to be the right time for me to buy, that I would be ready to buy a, a property in maybe a year or two. So they're like, so I went through it with a cohort in those early days while I was saving for a down payment, while I was, you know, just laying the foundation. And now fast forward, it's been a year and a half. Now I'm ready to buy a property. Now I want to go through it with a cohort again because my mindset is very different now when I'm actually ready to make offers than it was a year and a half ago when I was still saving up for yeah. down payment. Yeah. Right. Or I got to imagine too, if you went through your first one, which never goes according to plan. I mean, right. No matter, yeah. It, it just doesn't. And yeah. now you've got the experience of one under your belt and you can go through it again and go, oh, I, I should have done this. I should have yep. stepped in that, should not have stepped in that. Like, I feel like as you do it, that lesson becomes more almost like people that go back to grad school versus somebody who just does grad school right after, right right? after their bachelor's. And for people yeah. not watching us, Paula's just playing her Columbia glass. It's such a flex. <laughs> Look at mine, though. <laughs> Ooh, what is That's that? That's the Ferrari symbol? logo. Oh, Mine's the Ferrari. So I don't know if I'd take your Columbia over my Ferrari, but <laughs> maybe one produces the other. Maybe it's it's a two <laughs> thing. Do the Columbia, then you get the Ferrari. I don't know. Oh, they so, cost about the same. <laughs> here is it. <laughs> yeah. One comes with an object. The other one you get to just talk about. Here's our link. We believe in Paula in this course so much that we have partnered with Paula and here's what we're going to do for all of our Dieter listeners. And we're playing this on Stacking Benjamins week as well. So our stackers out there, if you go to stackingbenjamins.com slash Paula, that's stackingbenjamins.com slash Paula. What we're going to do, if you buy it through us, because wait, there's more, is that while people that know me know that property is not my expertise, but what is my expertise is that you want to make sure that your budget is in order to get that property finished. You want to make sure your budget is airtight. I put together from the time that I was a financial planner, what I used to call my Sherlock Holmes list, which is all the places where money is going. It's in the sofa cushions behind me. You know, you find 20 bucks in your pocket, but it's much more than that. Like there was money that I would reliably look and I would find money seeping out of my client's budget. And so we want to make those airtight so that more money can go into being able to do the rental property and not have it blow up. So mm. we will give you that sheet as well if you buy it through us, Joe Sherlock Holmes sheet. How about that, Paula? Sherlock Holmes sheet. Well, I that's like what that. I, that's what I yeah. call it. But I don't think the, the little. I don't think the official <laughs> name is that. But that was always when Tina, who still works with us today, when she was my assistant in financial planning. She would always, if somebody brought in their homework, which is show me your budget, she'd sit my Sherlock Holmes sheet right on top of it. And I would go through the Sherlock Holmes sheet. I'm like, oh, we got to look there. 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 And we would find thousands of dollars. It was wow. really cool that people didn't know that they had. So we will include that if you use our link, if you decide to enroll in Paula's course, stackingbenjamins.com slash Paula. That's it. Anything we didn't cover that we should have covered, Paula? Let's see. Oh, you know what we should cover? 2023. <laughs> because this is such a different time. All right. There's a few things that we should address related to the era that we live in. Deal. Uh, sorry, Joe. Am I going long? Do we have a... No, we are going long, but we specifically told everybody ahead of time, Crystal and I, that this was going to be a long discussion, so... Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. You know, you know me, I'm long form, <laughs> we got, right? We got like five more minutes, so we're good. <laughs> all right. So a few things that we should talk about. First of all, if you think, hey, property values, home prices are really expensive. Am I too late? I want to reassure you. I have heard people say that literally every year since 2013, 2014, right? Back in 2013, I heard people say, oh man, look, the prices have gone up so much since 2010. I'm too late, right? And then 2015, they said the same thing. And you oh, think to yourself now, God, if I'd gotten in in 2013, where everybody was saying no, how great right. would it be? Yeah, yeah. People in 2015 were like, look at how much the prices have gone up. Just look at how much they've gone up between 2012 and 2015. Look at how much they've gone up in the last three years. I am way too late. Damn it. I'm too late. All right. You know, and then 2017. Oh, look at, you know, and so consistently year after year after year, I always hear this. And so if 
I understand why you think this, but three years from now, do you think prices are going to be higher or lower? Right? Three years, I'm telling you, we are in a housing supply crisis. We have far more demand than we have supply. And that's a formula for home price increases. In addition to that, when interest rates drop, because interest rates are not going to be 7 or 8% forever, when interest rates drop, do you think there will be more buyers or do you think there will be fewer buyers, right? Back in 2020 or in 2021, I just posted about this on Twitter earlier today. Even in 2022, people kept saying, man, I'm trying to buy a home, but the moment a house comes on the market, it gets multiple offers on the day that it's listed. And you know, by 5 p.m. on the day it's listed, it's under contract with five backup offers, right? People in 2021 and 2022, when interest rates were low, were trying to buy a home, but there was so much competition. Everything was going for above asking price with like multiple offers. The average days on market, which is a measure of how long a home would sit on the market, was incredibly low. Tiny, yeah. Yeah, it was teeny tiny. Right. And so a lot of home buyers were frustrated because of all the competition of everything going above asking price. That's not a problem in 2023. Right. There's not a lot of competition from home buyers. So the advantage of being in a higher interest rate environment is that you get to buy a home at a time when there's not a lot of competition. You can buy something for potentially below asking price rather than at or above it. You can ask for additional contingencies within your offer, which is just a fancy word for you can ask for more stuff, right? As a buyer, you want to be making offers at a time when there isn't a lot of competition. And when interest rates decline, which inevitably they will, we don't know when, but at some point they will, when interest rates decline, there's a pretty good likelihood that there are going to be more buyers. Well, and, and if you can yeah. afford to buy now, with yeah. the additional interest expense that you have now, that when that interest expense goes lower later, right. when you refinance, it just becomes a more conservative deal. So if you can conservatively buy today, then it only gets better from here. Exactly. Marry the property, date the rate, right? Barbara, Barbara Corkin, by the way, literally this morning before you and I hit record, I was watching Barbara Corkin say the same thing you just said. She goes, the idea that prices are going to go down is ridiculous. It's not good. Prices are not going down. Yeah. Zillow, according to Fortune magazine, Zillow is predicting that home prices nationwide will rise about 6.5% by next holy, summer. Holy crap. Yeah. By summer 2024. Still a big number. Yeah. So yeah. marry the property, date the rate. Yeah. Well, and even besides that, I think that if you're going to buy knowledge, which is frankly what people are buying with this course, that knowledge helps you just ride the bike. Whenever you decide to buy you're going to know how to ride the bike better. You're going to know how yeah. to value it. And certainly that doesn't mean that I want people to procrastinate and wait because I do think it's what you do, not what you know, but still you're buying the knowledge to be able to pull the trigger whenever you want. Yeah, exactly. Stackybenjamins.com slash Paula. Paula Pant, thank you so much, my friend, for hanging out with us, teaching oh, our thank dealers. You. Yeah. Thank you. Big thanks to Paula for hanging out, Crystal. I like I like this idea, Crystal, though, of being conservative with your real estate investing. I mean, Paula talked a lot to me about being conservative. And I think, especially when you start out, being a little more, I see people get in trouble with real estate, not because they're too conservative, but because they're too aggressive. Right. You never want to bite off more than you can chew and that you can't afford to screw up your first deal. You want people to take you seriously. And so you want to take your time to learn the lingo, learn the ins and outs of everything, like because you don't want to cut corners. And what do people do when they're not prepared or run out of time? They cut corners. That's the first thing you do. And so when you're conservative, you're taking the approach of, listen, this is going to be, and we always talk about slow and steady. This is going to be a slow and steady kind of deal. Then you ramp it up. You know, she was happy to tell us about her biggest real estate mistake. What do you think yours was? Ooh, My biggest mistake was definitely not knowing what I was signing on that first deal. Oh. I just had a conversation yesterday that, what was the name of that old GMAC? I used to get class action settlement lawsuit checks. I've also gotten class action lawsuit 
settlement checks from Wells Fargo too, because there were things that I was jumping into that I didn't understand. Of course, they ended up working out, but thankfully the courts stepped in to say, hey, you did some bad predatory actions towards this group of people. You need to pay them back. But had I not been a part of those class action lawsuits, I wouldn't have known I had any rights. And there's still some things I probably got taken advantage of. So definitely just don't do these things alone. Have somebody you trust or know. And at the very least, I think the big thing there is read the contract. I was having a discussion with the wonderful comedian who writes for Stacking Benjamins, Lisa Curry, and she was talking about how many comedians don't read the contracts that they're given with these different you know, production companies or what it's the same thing in a real estate contract. Crystal, this is such a big transaction to not go through that contract. Uh, it is. I think a lot of people also, they want to rush into it and they feel like they don't have negotiating power. It's like, oh, well, this is their contract. And no, you're the one that's starting the transaction. So what you say goes. So if there's something you don't understand or you need clarification on, ask it. Because even for me building these buildings now in Chicago, I was getting a hard money loan and I had to ask someone, hey, what fees should I negotiate on? And I spoke to someone from FinCon Beach, you know, surrounding yourself with like-minded people. One of the guys there, he told me, oh, these are the fees that you can negotiate on. And he saved me a lot of money just because I was doing something new on my own. And Fabulous. They, yeah. So when they sent the contract, I was like, hold on, give me a minute. And I pretended like I was parking my car or something. You know, I pretended like I had a bad connection and I just reached out to someone else to ask, you know, what can I negotiate? I love that idea. I get coaching from a strategic coach and one of their big maxim is to ask who, not how. Ask who knows this. And by the way, that's why we partner with Paula is because clearly Paula knows. So it's stackingbenjamins.com slash Paula. And Crystal, I told everybody that if they use our link, we're going to throw in a bonus, which is my Sherlock Holmes sheet that I used when I was a financial planner to find money hidden in your budget. So we will throw that in. If you use our link, you can obviously not use our link. Then we don't get any affiliate income. You can go right to Paula's course, but we're going to give you a little extra if you do. I'm glad it wasn't a Sherlock Holmes monocle or a looking glass, <laughs> magnifying glass. I thought we'd save that for next time. That'll be Stacking <laughs> Deeds bonus. Stacking Deeds branded bonus. monocle. Yes. How cool will you look? Well, I'm sure all the cool kids have a monocle. Let's, <laughs> On top let's, of their glass. Let's dive into the community calendar before we say goodbye. There's only one real piece of news this week, Crystal, and that is that this show, like all podcasts, needs to have a budget so that we can keep podcasting. We need to actually find ways. You know, I don't think either one of us are in podcasting to get rich. I always laugh when I see people do that. However, we do have to hire help. We got the amazing Ivy who does our editing for us. Doug needs a biscuit thrown his way once in a while. So we, we need that. So Crystal, while I was at the podcast movement conference, we signed up with our host that's going to help us put some ads on the show. And we don't know what ads they are going to have. So, you know, don't be offended. Or if you are offended, reach out to us and call us on it. We love hearing from you guys. So definitely reach out to us, call us on it. Be like, hey, we heard an ad for dildos. We didn't like it. So please <laughs> let us know. If they have, well, I'm awake now. What? <laughs> Doug's dildos. Whoa. Anyway, but yeah. So let us know if you hear something that's crazy, or even if you hear something that you I think like. They just did. <laughs> the, the way that, the way that, and just to pull back the curtain a little bit, your ability to control what the advertisements are on your podcast depends on the listenership, and because this is a smaller show than Stacking Benjamins. And because it's in a niche and it's a newer show, real estate shows have a smaller audience than just a general audience show has. It's just like a personal finance show is a smaller audience than a comedy podcast will generally have. So our ability to say, no, we don't like that one. Yes, we do. We just don't have the ability to do that. And certainly we could have gone with a Patreon model, but I think the easiest way for us to implement making sure that we're able to keep podcasting was to do advertisements. So you'll hear them for now. They'll be just at the beginning of the show, just at the end. We will have still our read from time to time in the middle of Doug's trivia, but those will be for the podcast. 
I think that's it. I'm excited that we're going to get to keep podcasting. <laughs> yes, same, same. Yeah, people think I get paid all this money for podcasting. I'm like, no, it's a lot of work. For Those free. aren't your smarter friends. <laughs> that's a great way to figure out who your smart friends are. Yeah, that's takes... been my thing. I learned something and I like to teach it. I was teaching sewing, teaching fitness, and now real estate. It's like, why keep it to yourself? Let's share. I got a great thing for us to share, Crystal. We're ready. We're on the edge of our seats. We can share what our top three takeaways are and say goodbye. Oh, yes, we can. So yes. How do people get the show notes? First of all, head to stackingdeeds.net slash show notes. The show notes are written by yours truly. So even if you have feedback on any previous show notes, I'd love to hear it. You know, tell me if I'm too wordy or not wordy enough. And that's how you get your show notes delivered every week. Awesome. She's Crystal. I'm Joe. And here comes Doug. Doug, what are our big three takeaways today? Well, JS and CLH first, take some advice from Paula. Get started on your journey with real estate now. It isn't about just learning what to do. Success only happens when you make that leap. Second, what seems like a good idea isn't always one. Success in real estate doesn't always have to mean DIY. You can often make more money finding deals and focusing on the big picture with your empire and let the experts handle the floorboards and the painting. But the big lesson... Make sure you tell someone to leave the trunk unlocked during these special episodes. I could have gotten up and walked around. Oh, there's a cramp. Thanks to Paula Pat for joining us today. You can find out more about her Your First Real Estate course at stackingbenjamins.com slash Paula. We'll also include links in our show notes at stackingdeeds.net. Cramp! Cramp! (laughs) Cramp! 